Christ returns with the five first disciples to Nazareth, he baptizes his most holy mother, other incidents during this time. The mystic edifice of the militant church, which aspires to the most exalted mysteries of the divinity, is founded entirely upon the holy Catholic faith, established by our Redeemer and Master, its wise and prudent architect. To ensure this firmness in the first foundation stones, his disciples, he began immediately to imbue them with the truths and mysteries relating to his divinity and humanity. In order to make himself known as the Messiah and the Redeemer of the world, who had descended from the bosom of his eternal Father to assume human flesh, it was urgently necessary to explain to them the manner of his incarnation in the womb of his most blessed mother. It behooved him, therefore, in order that they might know and venerate her as a true mother and virgin, to speak to them of this heavenly mystery together with that, with what relates to the hypostatic union and the redemption. With this heavenly doctrine, then, were nourished the firstborn sons of the Savior, and before the apostles came into the presence of the great queen and lady, they had already conceived most exalted ideas of her celestial excellences. They had been informed that she was a virgin before, during, and after her paturation, and they had been inspired by Christ with the profoundest reverence and love, and filled with the desire of immediately seeing and knowing such a heavenly creature. Christ thus aimed not only to satisfy his own zeal in extending the, on to the honor of his holy mother, but also to excite in his apostles the highest veneration and reverence toward her. Although all of them were divinely enlightened, yet St. John began to distinguish himself in this love of Mary before all the rest. From the very first words of the Master concerning the dignity and excellence of his purest mother, he grew in the loving esteem of her holiness, for he was selected and prepared for greater privileges in the service of his queen, as I shall relate and as, re as recorded and as is recorded in the Gospels. The five disciples of the Lord begged him to grant them the consolation of seeing and reverencing his mother. In accordance with their petition, he journeyed directly to Nazareth through Galilee, continuing to preach and teach publicly on the way and proclaiming himself as the master of truth and eternal life. Many carried away by the force of his doctrines and by the light and grace overflowing into their hearts began to listen to him and to follow him, though he did not, for the present, call any more to be his disciples. It is worthy of notice that though the, the five disciples had conceived such an ardent devotion to the heavenly lady, and though they saw with their own eyes how worthy she was of her imminent position among creatures, yet they all maintained strict silence about their thoughts. By the disposition of heaven they seemed as if mute and ignorant in all that concerned the publication of what they thought and felt in regard of her excellences, for it was not befitting that these mysteries of our holy faith should be proclaimed to all men indiscriminately. The Son of Justice was now drawing upon souls, Malachi 4, 2, and it was necessary that its own splendor should shine forth to illumine all the nations, and although its resplendent moon, his mother, was now in the fullness of her sanctity, it behooved her to reserve her light for the night, in which the church should deplore the absence of that son in the bosom of his eternal father. And this office she fulfilled, as I shall relate in the third part, for then the splendor of the great lady broke forth, while before that time her holiness and excellence were manifested only to the apostles, in order that they might know and reverence her, and that they might listen to her as the worthy mother of the Redeemer of the world, and as the teacher of all virtue and perfection. The Savior then pursued his way to Nazareth, instructing his new children and disciples, not only in the mysteries of faith, but in all virtues by word and example, as he continued to do during the whole period of his evangelical preaching. With this in view, he searched out the poor and afflicted, consoled the sick and sorrowful, visited the infirmaries and prisons, performing miracles of mercy as well for body as for soul. Yet he did not profess himself as the author of any miracles until he attended the marriage feast at Cana, as I shall relate in the next chapter. While the Savior proceeded on his journey, his Most Holy Mother prepared to receive him and his disciples at Nazareth, for she was aware of all that happened, and therefore hospitably set her poor dwelling in order, and solicitously procured the necessary victuals beforehand for their entertainment. When the Savior of the world approached the house, his blessed mother awaited him at the door, and as he entered, prostrated herself on the ground, adoring him and kissing his hands and feet, while she asked for his blessing. 
Then she sounded the praise of the Most Holy Trinity in exalted and wonderful words, and also of his humanity in the presence and hearing of the new disciples. This she did not without mysterious purpose on her part, for besides showing to her divine Son the honor and adoration due to him as the true God-man, she wished also to make a return for the praise with which her Son had exalted her in the eyes of his disciples. Thus, just as the Son had in her absence instilled into the minds their minds the reverence for the dignity of his mother, so the most prudent and faithful mother, in the presence of her Son, wished to instruct them in regard to the worship due to their divine Master, as to their God and Redeemer. The profound humility and worship with which the Great Lady received Christ the Savior filled the disciples with new devotion and reverential fear for their divine Master. Henceforth she served them as an example and model of true devotion. Entering at once into her office as instructress and spiritual mother of the disciples of Christ by showing them how to converse with their God and Redeemer, they were immediately drawn toward their queen and cast themselves on their knees before her, asking to be received as her sons and servants. The first to do this was St. John, who from that time on distinguished himself in exalting and reverencing Mary before all the apostles, while she on her part received him with an especial love, for besides his excelling in virginal chastity, he was of a meek and humble disposition. The great lady received them all as her guests, serving them their meals and combining the solicitude of a mother with the modesty and majesty of a queen, so that she caused admiration even in the holy angels. She served her divine son on her knees in deepest reverence. At the same time, she spoke of the majesty of their teacher and redeemer to the apostles, instructing them in the great doctrines of the Christian faith. During that night, when the apostles had retired, the Savior betook himself to the oratory of his purest mother, as he had been wont to do, and she, the most humble among the humble, placed herself at his feet, as in the years gone by. In regard to the practice of humility, all that she could do seemed little to the great queen, and much less than she ought to, in view of his infinite love and immense gifts received at his hands. She confessed herself as useless as the dust of the earth. The Lord lifted her from the ground and spoke to her words of life and eternal salvation, yet quietly and serenely. For at this period he began to treat her with greater reserve in order to afford her a chance of merit, as I have mentioned when I spoke of this departure for the desert and for his baptism. The Most Blessed Lady also asked him for the sacrament of baptism which he had now instituted and which he had promised her before in order that this might be administered with a dignity becoming as well the son as the mother, an innumerable host of angelic spirits descended from heaven in visible forms. Attended by them, Christ himself baptized his purest mother. Immediately the voice of the Eternal Father was heard saying, quote, This is my beloved daughter in whom I take delight. Unquote. The incarnate word said, quote, This is my mother, much beloved, whom I have chosen and who will assist me in all my works. Unquote. And the Holy Ghost added, quote, this is my spouse, chosen among thousands, unquote. The purest lady felt and received such great and numerous effects of grace in her soul that no human words can describe them. For she was exalted to new heights of grace, and her holy soul was made resplendent with new and exquisite beauty of heaven. She received the characteristic token impressed by this sacrament, namely that of the children of Christ and his holy church. In addition to the ordinary effects of this sacrament, outside of the remission of sins of which she stood in no need, she merited especial graces on account of the humility with which she submitted to this sacrament of purification. By it she accumulated blessings like to those of her divine Son, with only this difference, that she received an increase of grace which was not possible in Christ. Thereupon the humble mother broke out in a canticle of praise with the holy angels, and prostrate before her divine Son, she thanked him for the most efficacious graces she had received in this sacrament. Instruction given to me by the Queen of Heaven. <clears throat> My daughter, I see thee much moved to emulation and desire by the great happiness of the disciples of my most holy son, and especially that of St. John, my favored servant. It is certain that I loved him in a special manner, because he was most pure and candid as a dove, and in the eyes of the Lord he was very pleasing, both on account of his purity and on account of his love toward me. His example should serve thee as a spur to do what, that which my son and I expect of thee. 
Thou art aware, my dearest, that I am the most pure mother, and that I receive with maternal affection all those who fervently and devoutly desire to be my children and servants of the Lord. Hallelujah. But the love which he has given me, I shall embrace them with open by the love which he has given me, I shall embrace them with open arms, and shall be their intercessor and advocate. Thy poverty, uselessness, and weakness shall be for me only a more urgent motive for manifesting toward thee my most liberal kindness. Therefore, I call upon thee to become my chosen and beloved daughter in the Holy Church. I shall, however, make the fulfillment of my promise depend upon a service on thy part, namely, that thou have a true and holy emulation of the love with which I loved St. John, and of all the blessings flow, flowing from it by imitating him as perfectly as thy powers will allow. Hence thou must promise to fulfill all that I now command thee, without failing in the least point. I desire then that thou labor until all love of self die within thee, that thou suppress all the effects of the first sin until all the earthly inclina inclinations consequent upon it are totally extinguished that thou seek to restore within thee that dove-like sincerity and simplicity which destroys all malice and duplicity. In all thy doings thou must be an angel, since the condescension of the Most High with thee was so great as to furnish thee with the light and intelligence more of an angel than that of a human creature. I have procured for thee these great blessings, and therefore it is but reasonable on my part to expect thee to correspond with them in thy works and in thy thoughts. In regard to me, thou must cherish a continual affection and loving desire of pleasing and serving me, being always attentive to my counsels, and having thy eyes fixed upon me in order to know and execute what I command. Then shalt thou be my true daughter, and I shall be thy protectress and loving mother. Book 2. The Marriage at Cana. How Most Holy Mary accompanied the Redeemer of the world in his preaching. The humility shown by the heavenly queen in regard to the miracles wrought by her divine son, the transfiguration of the Lord, his entrance into Jerusalem, his passion and death, his triumph over Lucifer and his demons by his death on the cross, the most sacred resurrection of the Savior, and his wonderful ascension into heaven. At the request of his most blessed mother, Christ our Savior begins to manifest himself to the world by his first miracle. The evangelist, St. John, who in his first chapter mentions the calling of Nathaniel, the fifth disciple of the Lord, begins his second chapter with the words, quote, And the third day there was a marriage at Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the marriage, unquote. John 2, 1. Hence it appears that the blessed lady was in Cana before her most holy son was invited to the wedding. I was ordered by my superiors to inquire how this harmonizes with what I have said in the preceding chapter, and to ascertain what day was meant. Then I was informed that, notwithstanding the different opinions of the commentators, this history of the Queen and that of the Gospels coincided with each other, and that the course of events was as follows. Christ the Lord, with the five apostles or disciples on entering Galilee, betook themselves directly to Nazareth, preaching and teaching on the way. On this journey he tarried only a short time, but at least three days. Having arrived at Nazareth, he baptized his blessed mother, as I have related, and thereupon immediately went forth to preach with his disciples in some of the neighboring places. In the meanwhile, the blessed lady, being invited to the marriage mentioned by the evangelist, went to Cana, for it was the marriage of some of her relatives in the fourth degree on her mother's St. Anne's side. While the great queen was in Cana, the news of the coming of the Redeemer into the world and of his having chosen some disciples had already spread. By the disposition of the Lord, who secretly ordained it for his own high ends and through the management of his mother, he was called and invited to the wedding with his disciples. The third day mentioned by the evangelist as the wedding day of Cana is the third day of the week, and although he does not say this expressly, Yet likewise he does not say that it was the third day after the calling of the disciples or his entrance into Galilee. If he had meant this, he certainly would have been more explicit. According to the ordinary course, it was impossible that Jesus should be present at a wedding on the third day after his entering Galilee from Judea, at the place where he chose his first disciples. For Cana lay within the limits of the tribe of Zabulon, near the boundary of Phoenicia, far northward from Judea and adjoining the tribe of Aser, a considerable distance from the place where the Savior entered from Judea into Galilee. If the wedding at Cana had been on the third day after the calling of the first disciples, then only two days intervened, whereas the journey from Judea to Cana required three days, 
Moreover, he would first have to be near Cana in order to receive such an invitation, which would likewise require some time. Then also, in order to journey from Judea to Cana, he would have had to he would have to pass through Nazareth, for Cana is nearer to the Mediterranean Sea and to the tribe of Aser, as I have said. Hence his mother would certainly have known of his coming, and therefore would have waited, awaited his arrival instead of going to her visit to Cana. That the evangelist does not mention the visit of the Lord to Nazareth, nor the baptism of the blessed lady, was not because it did not really happen, but because he and the other writers confine themselves to that which pertains to their purpose. St. John himself says that they omit the mention of many miracles performed by the Lord, John 20.30, since it was not necessary to describe all of them. From this explanation, it will be seen that this history is confirmed by the Gospels themselves by the very passage in question. I have to let my cat out. Okay, sorry about that. I'm slave to the cats. I'm sure some of you can relate. <laughs> While therefore the queen of the world was in Cana, her most holy son with his disciples was invited to the marriage, and as in his condescension he had brought about this invitation, he accepted it. He betook himself to this wedding in order to satisfy and confirm the state of matrimony and in order to begin to establish the authenticity of his doctrine by the miracle which he was to perform and of which he was to declare himself openly as the author. As he had already proclaimed himself as the teacher by admitting his disciples, it was necessary to confirm their calling and give authority to his doctrine in order that they might receive and believe it. Hence, though he had performed other wonders in private, he had not made himself known as the author of them in public, as on this occasion. On this account, the evangelist says, quote, This beginning of miracles to Jesus in Cana of Galilee, unquote. John 2.11 This miracle took place on the same day on which a year ago had happened the baptism of Jesus by St. John. This day was also the anniversary of the adoration of the kings, and therefore the Holy Roman Church celebrates the three mysteries on one and the same day, the 6th of January. Our Lord had now completed the 30th year of his life and had begun his 31st year, 13 days before, being those from the Nativity to Epiphany. The Master of Life entered the house of the marriage feast, saluting those present with the words, quote, The peace of the Lord and his light be with you, unquote, literally fulfilling them by his arrival. Wow. Thereupon he began to exhort and instruct the bridegroom concerning the perfection and holiness of his state of life. In the meanwhile, the Queen of Heaven instructed the bride in a similar manner, admonishing her in sweetest and yet most powerful words concerning her obligations. Both of the marriage couple afterwards fulfilled most perfectly the duties of their state, into which they were ushered and for which they were strengthened by the sovereigns of heaven and earth. I will not detain myself in declaring that this bridegroom was not St. John the Evangelist. It is enough to know, as I have stated in the last chapter, that St. John had come with the Savior as his disciple. The Lord had not come to this wedding in order to disapprove of matrimony, but in order to establish it anew and give it credit, sanctifying and constituting it as a sacrament by his presence. Hence, he could not have had the intention of separating the two married people immediately after they had entered into this union, nor did the evangelist ever have any intention of marrying. On the contrary, our Savior, having exhorted the bridegroom and bride, added a fervent prayer addressed to the Eternal Father, in which he besought him to pour his blessings upon the institution for the propagation of the human race in the new law and to vest this state with sacramental power to sanctify all those who would receive it worthily in his holy church. The Blessed Virgin, cooperating in this work and in all others for the benefit of the human race, 
knew of the wishes and the prayer of her divine son and joined him therein and as she took upon herself the duty of making a proper return which is so much neglected by other men she broke out in canticles of praise and thanksgiving to the lord for this benefit and the angels at her invitation joined her in the praise of god this however was known only to the lord and savior who rejoiced in the wise behavior of his purest mother as much as she rejoiced in his then they spoke and conversed with those that came to the wedding but always with a wisdom and gravity worthy of themselves, and with a view of enlightening the hearts of all that were present. The most prudent lady spoke very few words, and only when she was asked or when it was very necessary, for she always listened and attended without interruption to the doings and sayings of the Lord, treasuring them up and meditating upon them in her most pure heart. All the words and behavior of this great queen during her life furnish an exquisite example of retirement and modesty, and on this occasion she was an example not only for the religious but especially for women in the secular state if they could only keep it before their mind in similar circumstances such for instance as this marriage feast afforded thus learning to keep silence to restrain themselves compose their interior and allow no levity or looseness to creep into their exterior deportment for never is moderation more necessary than in times of danger and in women, the most precious adornment and the most charming beauty is silence, restraint, and modesty, by which many vices are shut out, and by which all virtues of a chaste and respectable woman receive their crowning grace. <clears throat> Boy, that's not what people think now, huh? At the table, the Lord and his most holy mother ate of some of the food, but with the greatest moderation yet also without showing outwardly their great abstinence. Although, when they were alone, they did not eat of such food, as I have already recorded, yet these teachers of perfection, who wished not to disprove the common life of men, but wished to perfect it, accommodated themselves to all circumstances, without any extremes or noticeable singularity, wherever it was possible to do so, without blame and without imperfection. The Lord not only inculcated this by his example, but he commanded his disciples and apostles to eat of what was placed before them on their evangelical tours of preaching, and not to show any singularity in their way of life, such as is indulged in by the imperfect and those little versed in the paths of virtue. For the truly poor and humble must not presume to have a choice in their victuals. By divine arrangement and in order to give occasion to the miracle, the wine gave out during the meal, and the lady the kind lady said to her son, quote, They have no wine. Unquote. And the Lord answered, quote, Woman, what is that to me and to thee? My hour has not yet come. Unquote. This answer of Christ was not intended as a reproach, but contained a mystery, for the most prudent queen had not asked for a miracle by mere accident, but by divine light. She knew that the opportune time for the manifestation of the divine power of her son was at hand. She, who was full of wisdom and knowledge concerning the works of the redemption, and well was well informed at what time and on what occasions the Lord was to perform them, therefore she could not be ignorant of the proper moment for the beginning of this public manifestation of Christ's power. It must also be remembered that Jesus did not pronounce these words with any signs of disapproval, but with a quiet and loving majesty. It is true that he did not address the Blessed Virgin by the name of Mother, but Woman. However, this was because, as I have said before, he had begun to treat her with greater reserve. The mysterious purpose hidden in this answer of Christ was to confirm the disciples in their belief of his divinity and to show himself to all as the true God independent of his mother, in his being, and in his power of working miracles. On this account, also, he suppressed the tender appellation of mother, and called her woman, saying, What does it concern thee, or what part have we, thou and I, in this? As if he wanted to say, The power of performing miracles I have not received from thee, although thou hast given me the human nature in which I am to perform them. My divinity alone is to perform them, and for it the hour has not yet come. He wished to give her to understand that the time for working miracles was not to be determined by his most holy mother, but by the will of God, even though the most prudent lady should ask for them at an opportune and befitting time. The Lord wished to have it understood that the working of miracles depended upon a higher than the human will, 
on a will divine and above that of his mother and altogether beyond it. And the will of his mother was to be subject to that which was his as the true God. Hence, Christ infused into the minds of the apostles a new light by which they understood the hypostatic union of his two natures and the derivation of the human nature from his mother and of the divine by generation from his eternal father. <clears throat> the blessed lady well understood this mystery. And she said with quiet modesty to the servants, quote, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye, unquote. In these words, showing her wise insight into the will of her son, if you hear something, it's my dog sleeping and he's snoring a little bit. In these words, showing her wise insight into the will of her son, she spoke as the mistress of the whole human race, teaching us mortals that in order to supply all our necessities and wants, it was required and sufficient on our part to do all that the Savior and those taking his place shall command. Such a lesson could not but come from such a mother, an advocate, who is so desirous of our welfare, and who, since she so well knew what hindrance we place in the way of his great and numerous miracles for our benefits, wishes to instruct us to meet properly the benefit in beneficent intentions of the Most High. The Redeemer of the world ordered the servants to fill the jars or water pots, which according to the Hebrew custom had been provided for the occasion. All having been filled, the Lord bade them draw some of the wine into which the water had been changed, and bring it to the chief steward of the feast, who was at the head of the table, and who was one of the priests of the law. When this one had tasted of the wine, he called the bridegroom in surprise and said to him, quote, Every man at birth set us forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now, unquote. The steward knew nothing of the miracle when he tasted of the wine, because he sat at the head of the table, while Christ and his mother with the disciples occupied the lower end of the table, practicing the doctrine which he was afterwards to teach us, namely, that in being invited to a feast we should not seek to occupy the better places, but be satisfied with the lowest. Then the miracle of changing the water into wine and the dignity of the Redeemer was revealed. The disciples believed anew, as the evangelist says, and their faith in him was confirmed. Not only they, but many of the others that were present, believed that he was the true Messiah, and they followed him in the, to the city of Capernaum, whither the evangelist tells us he, with his mother and disciples, went from Cana. There, according to St. Matthew, he began to preach, declaring himself the teacher of men. What St. John says of his manifesting his glory by the sign or miracles, by this sign or miracle, does not contradict his having wrought miracles before, but supposes them to have been wrought in secret. Nor does he assert that his glory was not shown also in other miracles, but infers merely that Jesus did not wish to be known as their author because the right time determined by divine wisdom had not come. It is certain that he performed many and admirable wonders in Egypt, such as the destruction of the temples and their idols. To all these miracles, Most Holy Mary responded with heroic acts of virtue in praise and thanksgiving to the Most High, and his holy name was thus gloriously manifested. She was intent on, the, on encouraging the new believers and in the service of her divine Son, fulfilling these duties with peerless wisdom and charity. With burning love, she cried to the Eternal Father, asking Him to dispose the hearts and souls of men for the enlightening words of the Incarnate Word and drive from them the darkness of their ignorance. Instruction given to me by the Queen, the Mistress of Heaven. My daughter, without any excuse is the forgetfulness and negligence shown by each and every one of the children of the Church in regard to the spread and manifestation of the glory of their God by making known His holy name to all rational creatures. This negligence is much more blamable now, since the eternal word became man in my womb, taught the world, and redeemed it for this very purpose. With this end in view, the Lord founded his church, enriched it with blessings and spiritual treasures, assigned it to the ministers, and endowed it with temporal riches. All these gifts are intended not only to preserve the church in its present state, but to extend it and draw others to the regeneration of the Catholic faith. All should help along to spread the fruits of the death of the Redeemer. Some can do it by prayer and urgent desires for the exaltation of His holy name. That's what I try to do. Others by almsgiving. I do that too. Others by diligent preaching. Others by fervent works of charity. 
But if this remissness is perhaps less culpable in the ignorant and the poor, who have none to exhort them, it is very reprehensible in the rich and the powerful, and especially in the ministers and prelates of the church, whose particular duty is the advancement of the church of God. Many of them, forgetting the terrible account which they will have to render, seek only their own vain honor instead of Christ's. They waste the patrimony of the blood of the Redeemer in undertakings and aims that not even fit to mention, and through their fault allow innumerable souls to perish, who by proper exertions could have been gained for the Holy Church, or at least they lose the merit of such ex exertions and deprive Christ of the glory. Exertions, okay. And deprive Christ of the glory of having such faithful ministers in his church. The same responsibility rests upon the princes and the powerful of the world, who receive from the hands of God honors, riches, and temporal blessings for advancing the glory of the deity, and yet think less of this obligation than any other. Do thou grieve for all these evils and labor, as far as thy strength will allow, that the glory of the Most High be manifest, and that he be known in all nations, and that from the very stones may be generated sons of Abraham. Matthew 3, 9. Since of all this thou art capable, beseech him to send able workers and worthy ministers of his church, in order to draw men to the sweet yoke of the gospel. For great and plentiful is the harvest, and few are the faithful laborers and zealous helpers for harvesting it. Let what I have told thee of the, my maternal and loving solicitude in gaining followers for my son and in preserving them in his doctrine and companionship be to thee a living example for thy own conduct. Never let the flame of this charity die out in thy breast. Let also my silence and modesty at the wedding feast be an inviolable rule for thee and thy religious and all exterior actions in retirement, moderation, and discretion of words, especially in the presence of men, for these virtues are are the court dress with which the spouses of Christ must adorn themselves in order to find grace in his divine eyes. Most Holy Mary accompanies the Savior in his preaching tours. She bears many hardships and takes care of the women that follow him, conducting herself in all things with the highest perfection. It would not be foreign to the purpose of this history to describe the miracles and the heroic works of Christ, our Redeemer and Master, for in almost all of them his most blessed mother, blessed and holy mother concurred and took part. But I cannot presume to undertake a work so arduous and so far above human strength and capacity. For the evangelist St. John, after having described many miracles of Christ, says at the end of his gospel that Jesus did many other things, which if they were all described, could not be contained in all the books of the world. John 21, 25. If such a task seemed so impossible to the evangelist, how much more to an ignorant woman, more useless than the dust of the earth. All that is necessary and proper and abundantly sufficient for founding and preserving the church has been written by the four evangelists, and it is not necessary to repeat it in this history. Yet in order to compose this history, and in order not to pass over in silence so many great works of the exalted queen, which have not been mentioned, it is necessary to touch on a few particulars. Moreover, I think that to write of them, and thus fasten them in my memory, will be both consoling and useful for my advancement. The others, which the evangelists recorded in their Gospels, and of which I have not been commanded to write, are better preserved for the beatific vision, or the saints shall see them manifested to them by the Lord, and where they will eternally praise him for such magnificent works. Oh, I can't wait. From Cana in Galilee, Christ the Redeemer walked to Capernaum, a large and populous city near the Sea of Tiberias. Here, according to St. John, John 2, 12, he remained some days, though not many, for as the time of the Pasch was approaching, he gradually drew nigh to Jerusalem in order to celebrate this feast on the 14th of the moon of March. His most blessed mother, having rid herself of her house in Nazareth, accompanied him hence, thenceforth in his tours of preaching and of teaching to the very foot of the cross. She was absent from him only a few times, as when the Lord absented himself on Mount Tabor, Matthew 17, 1, or on some particular conversions as, for instance, that of the Samaritan woman, or when the heavenly lady herself remained behind with certain persons in order to instruct and catechize them. But always after a short time she returned to her Lord and Master, following the Son of Justice until it sank into the abyss of death. 
During these journeys, the Queen of Heaven proceeded on foot, just as her divine Son. If even the Lord was fatigued on the way, as St. John says, John 4, 6, how much more fatigued was this purest lady? What hardships did she not endure on such arduous journeys in all sorts of weather, such as the rigorous treatment according to the Mother of Mercy to her most delicate body? What she endured in these labors alone is so great that not all the mortals together can ever satisfy their obligations to her in this regard. Sometimes, by permission of the Lord, she suffered such great weakness and pains that he was constrained to relieve her miraculously. At other times, he commanded her to rest herself at some stopping place for a few days, while again on certain occasions he gave such lightness to her body that she could move about without difficulty as if on wings. As I have already mentioned, the Heavenly Lady had the whole doctrine of the evangelical law written in her heart. Nevertheless, she was as solicitous and attentive as a new disciple to the preaching and doctrine of her Divine Son, and she had instructed her angels to report to her, if necessary, the sermons of the Master whenever she was absent. To the sermons of her Son she always listened on her knees, Thus, according to the utmost of her powers, showing the reverence and worship due to his person and doctrine, as she was aware of each, at each moment of the interior operations of the soul of Christ and of his continual prayers to the Eternal Father for the proper disposition of the hearts of his hearers and for the growth of the seed of his doctrine into eternal life, the Most Loving Mother joined the Divine Master in his petitions and prayers and in securing for them the blessings of her most ardent and tearful charity. By her attention and reverence, she taught and moved others to appreciate duly the teaching and instructions of the Savior of the world. She also knew the interior of those that listened to the preaching of the Lord, their state of grace or sin, their vices and virtues. This various and hidden knowledge, so far above the capacity of men, caused in the Heavenly Mother many wonderful effects of highest charity and other virtues. It inflamed her with zeal for the honor of the Lord and with ardent desires that the fruits of the redemption be not lost to the souls, while at the same time the danger of their loss to the souls through sin moved her to exert herself in the most fervent prayer for their welfare. She felt in her heart a piercing and cruel sorrow that God should not be known, adored, and served by all his creatures, and this sorrow was in proportion to the unequaled knowledge and understanding she had of all these mysteries. For the souls that would not give entrance to divine grace and virtue she sorrowed with ineffable grief and was wont to shed tears of blood at the thought of their misfortune what the great queen suffered in this her solicitude and in her labors exceeds beyond all measure the pains endured by all the martyrs of the world all the followers of the savior and whomever he received into his ministry she treated with incomparable prudence and wisdom especially those whom she held in such high veneration and esteem as the apostles of Christ. As a mother, she took care of all, and as a powerful queen, she procured necessities for their bodily nourishment and comforts. Sometimes, when she had no other resources, she commanded the holy angels to bring provisions for them and for the women in her company. In order to assist them toward advancing in the spiritual life, the great queen labored beyond possibility of human understanding, not only by her continual and fervent prayers for them, but by her precious example and by her counsels, with which she nourished, nourished and strengthened them as a most prudent mother and teacher. When the apostles or disciples were assailed by any doubts which frequently happened in the beginning, or when they were attacked by some secret temptation, the great lady immediately hastened to their assistance in order to enlighten and encourage them by the peerless light and charity shining forth in her and by the sweetness of her words, they were exquisitely consoled and rejoiced. They were enlightened by her wisdom, chastened by her humility, quieted by her modesty, enriched by all the blessings that flowed from this storehouse of all the gifts of the Holy Ghost. For all these benefits, for the calling of the disciples, for the conversion and perseverance, of the just, and for all the works of grace and virtue, she made a proper return to God, celebrating these events and festive hymns. As the evangelist tells us, some of the women of Galilee followed Christ the Redeemer on his journeys. St. Matthew, St. Mark, and St. Luke tell us that some of those whom he had cured of demonical possession and of other infirmities accompanied and served him. Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 8. 
For the master of eternal life excluded no sex from his following, imitation and doctrine. Hence some of the women attending upon him and served him, attended upon him and served him from the very beginning of his preaching. The divine wisdom so ordered it for certain purposes, among which was also the desire to provide proper companions for his blessed mother during these travels. Our queen interested herself in a special manner in these pious and holy women, gathering them around her, teaching and catechizing them, and bringing them as listeners to the sermons of her divine son. Although she herself was fully enlightened and instructed in the evangelical doctrine, and abundantly able to teach them the way of eternal life, Nevertheless, partly in order to conceal this secret of her heart, she always availed herself of the sayings of Christ in his public preaching as a text for her instructions and exhortations whenever she taught these and many other women who came to her either before or after hearing the Savior of the world. Not all of them followed Christ, but through the efforts of the Heavenly Lady, all of them received sufficient knowledge of the sacred mysteries for their conversion. Thus, she drew innumerable women to the knowledge of Christ, to the way of eternal salvation and evangelical perfection, though the evangelists say no more of them than that some of them followed Christ. It was not necessary for the evangelists, how could some of them not have? It was not necessary for the evangelists to go into these particulars in their histories. The admirable works of the Blessed Lady among the women stopped not short with merely teaching them divine faith and virtues by word of mouth, but she also taught them to practice the most ardent charity by visiting the sick in the infirmaries, the poor, the imprisoned and afflicted, nursing with her own hands the wounded, consoling the sorrowful and giving aid to those in necessity. If I were to mention all these works, it would be necessary to fill the greater part of this history with discourses on them or to make it much more extensive. I'm only going to read for four or five more minutes. Nor are the innumerable and vast miracles of the great queen during the public preaching of Christ our Lord recorded in the Gospels or in other histories, for the evangelists spoke only of the wonders wrought by Christ, and in so far as was useful to establish the faith of the church. It was necessary that men should first be well established and confirmed in this faith before the great deeds of the Most Holy Mother should become manifest. According to what has been given me to understand, it is certain that she brought about not only many miraculous conversions, but she cured the blind and the sick, and called the dead to life. That this should be so was proper for many reasons. On the one hand, she was the assistant in the principal work for which the Incarnate Word came into the world, namely in his preaching and his redemption, for thereby the Eternal Father opened up the treasures of his omnipotence and infinite goodness, manifesting them on the in the divine word and in the heavenly mother on the other hand she was his mother she as his mother was to resemble her son in the working of miracles increasing the glory of both for in this way she accredited the dignity and doctrine of her son and eminently and most efficaciously assisted him in his ministry that these miracles should remain concealed was due both to the disposition of divine providence and to the earnest request of mary herself Hence she performed them with such a wise secrecy that all the glory redounded to the exaltation of the Redeemer, in whose name and virtue they were wrought. The same course she also maintained in her instructions, for she did not preach in public, nor at any prearranged place or time, nor to those who were attended to by the appointed teachers and ministers of the Divine Word. The Blessed Lady knew that this kind of work was not incumbent upon women. 1 Corinthians 14.34 she contented herself with the assistance she could render by private instruction and conversation, which she did with celestial wisdom and efficacy. By this assistance and by her prayers, she, she secured more conversions than all the preachers of the world. And that's where I'm going to stop tonight. Blessed be God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. May God bless and keep you.